Good, thank you for your patience. Um, rest assured, building an API with Dancer or Dancer 2 in specific. Um, so this is me, Theo, the oldest sent a newbie. Uh, 2013, I entered the Perl community for the first time, proudly sponsored by the Perl community. You guys, thank you very much still. I do organize the Dutch Perl workshop. By the way, if you haven't registered yet, be quick. We're going to have the Dutch Pearl workshop in Amsterdam on the 1st of April. So you can still do that. Be quick, otherwise you won't get a t-shirt or a too small one. Stefan will be very disappointed if he gets his too small one. Okay, then what else? Cpen, that's my name there. And if you want to send me an email, do that. Maybe you get a response. You might try to ring me. That's maybe faster. Okay, my talk is about this. Dancer 2, a lightweight web framework. I love it. It's a very nice way to build your uh, web applications. It's very good, it's very easy to understand. Uh, I tried to understand Mojo, <laughs> headaches. Never tried Catalyst, but okay. Now, this is uh, something very, very, very bad. So this is my apologize, uh, apology for what happened. I arrived here on Sunday afternoon, early. Thought to myself, let's have a look around at uh, Nuremberg with the more beautiful castle and the tunnels underneath where you have these old beer uh, tunnels, uh, beer lager, that's where the word comes from Germany, lager. Um, came back to the hostel and this thing disappeared, my bag, including my laptop, including all my nice stuff, um, including my presentation. No backup. Mm. So, I had to uh, redo my presentation. If I look a little bit sleepy, then you understand why. I had only two hours sleep tonight, uh, this night. So, now, the real stuff. A simple web application. Let's build a very, very, very simple web application. We have a database with uh, users, and there we go. This is a package simple web user. We have Dancer2, blah, blah, the skeleton, where we have a root in our directory, uh, in our URLs, in our website, and that will give the usual index.html. Let's have a slash users where we can actually also search for users. Very nice, you have these forms that will have either a form input or the list of users you find. And of course, if you want to have specific details of a user, you go to slash users slash blah, 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 blah. So this is the very tiny little bit of the route you will make in your dancer application where you have a parameter called name. And if you have that, you will search the database if not, then you will just use all users, fine. And then you render the template users, and woo, there you go. Anybody any experience by Dancer? Or is it familiar to you? Most is experience with it, not everybody. Good, so I try to slow down a little bit, not to rush through it too much. So this route users we have, um, and Dancer just the template rendering all at the end. Um, the other one, the slash user slash user ID, that's dot, dot, no, that's not dot, dot, that's semi, that column, that column, yes. That column UUID is a funny way for Dancer to extract uh, parts of the URL path, and now you have a variable uh, UUID, which you can use in your, um, in your route as a kind of variable, like we have here. You look for the user in the results at user, find, that user with the UUID with the parameters called UUID. <laughs> Boring, all right, good. If you can't find it, the usual thing, you'll render a 404 page, which means you haven't found it. Uh, and otherwise, you'll render that template called user details, and that template engine is nicely wrapping everything into HTML. Bang, that is our web application, very simple. I showed you this because there's a very big analogy between web applications and REST APIs. Not everything, but most of it. So let's build a web API, REST API. A very simple API, and Dancer is really simple. Lots of the stuff that Dancer does is all in a config file, and this config file, we just do something very similar, very simple here. We just say, if you have something to display or give back in your API, render it in JSON. And I have some funny parameters here. You can skip the last bit of engine serializer JSON pretty one. I like the pretty printing. 
because it's more readable, especially for presentations. Otherwise, you get just one big line of JSON. Good. So let's make some changes to that skeleton we had. This is what we had, and this is what it will be. Good. No changes. There are some changes here. Instead of this template rendering we had for this HTML page for the form and uh, uh, the list of users, we're going to simply return mm, yeah, something funny written here. That's the problem with, with Perl. You can just write everything in one line. It will return you a list of hash refs where you have two um, attributes. One is href a unique URL to John Doe, or a unique URL for Mary Jane. These URLs are called unique resource identifiers in APIs, because there's only one identifier that will tell you which, is which user. Uh, Mary Jane and John Doe should not have the same, should not have the same, <coughs> all right, mm, okay, mm, good. Anyways, they should not. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> nice to do that. The other one, the user details. Well, REST APIs are very simple. You just have this resource called users, and if you append that user, unique user, unique, unified identifier ID, whatever is actually, UUID, or anyway, if you add that magic number at the end to your URL, you will get the details of a user. But, no, we're not using these templates anymore called user details. We're just returning this hash. And since we're doing nice, funny JSON rendering, as we did at the beginning in the config file, this is what will happen if you get to local host user and this unique identifier. Um, you'll get this JSON structure back, which tells you this John Doe and has a nickname JD and an email address. So this is the way you have a API, very simple API that will just give you either a whole list of users or a specific user with specific user IDs and user details. All right. Let's get to something more complicated because I just showed you how to create the JSON structure. Well, not every API produces JSON. What about XML or other funny things? Um, no, it's not in the room. It's not even here, I think. You could also do rendering a structure called JSON plus HAL, which is a very complicated structure to describe the relationships between uh, a specific uh, resource and related resources. It will give you uh, just like an HTML page links to different places in your API. Very nice. Very complicated. Um, well, what about returning a picture or a picture in JPEG or a picture in TIFF? Oh, yes, we, we can do print. Anyways, we have a thing that's called content negotiation. And maybe you remember me talking about um, the talk last year where I was talking about how you can produce uh, APIs with language specific parts in it. This is what I was talking about, speak English or, well, no, you Germans are fine, good. For contact negotiation, you have two different versions of doing it. It's either server-driven or client-driven, which means that either the server is going to do the best effort to give you the most suitable response you can think of. You actually have to tell it a little bit like, mm, I like this, and what about that? Can you do this for me? Mm. So, yes, there it is. Client-driven uh, content negotiation, the other hand, is that the client is very, very, very specific and says, I want a .json file. I want this URL, and there's no way to get around with it. If you don't have it, bollocks. Which both have their merits, problems, etc. Let's go back to one of those beautiful Plugins already available. Well, it's not even a plugin. Those beautiful things of Dancer 2. It has a thing called Dancer 2 Serializer Mutable. You saw me doing this thing in the beginning in my config file, 
I said, give me a serializer called JSON. Now let's produce XML. Mm, bad example. Let's produce something funny like a uh, dumper, data dump. Or what about a uh, YAML? Well, just change that JSON into mutable, and all of a sudden, our API is capable of delivering different types of contents. So what you do, you go back to the same address, and bang. We didn't tell it which kind of result you wanted back. We have in HTTP these uh, headers. One of them is the accept header, which uh, tells the server to render it in a specific format. We didn't tell it, and unfortunately, serialized immutable will just give you a 500 if you don't specify it. Ah, bad. Bang. Good. Anyways, it works. Just do what serializer immutable expects you to do. Just a lot of nasty things underneath as well, but okay. Because if you do it with a content type, which is not a request, uh, never mind. Forget about it. I'm running out of time. Good. The other one. Dancer 2 plugin REST. Yes, that looks good to me. We're talking about REST APIs. So there's a plugin called REST. Whoever approved this name, <coughs> good. Because it does nothing to do with REST at all. What it does, the nice thing, it takes that long URL, and like I said, it's client-driven at this stage. It just adds there its file extension. You just say .json at the end, and guess what? It returns you a JPEG. It will turn you a JSON structure. Good. Um, you never can rely on file extensions. How many times have we opened a .jpeg and all of a sudden we have a virus on our computer? Yes, that's a .jpeg thing. Viruses are .jpeg. Um, don't rely on them. You can append .xml and guess what we will get back? Yes, XML and so on and so on and so on. So we append that, that .format at the end. And this is what's happening with our API. So we get a use Dancer 2 plugin REST and there's a funny thing that says prepare my whole routing table for serializers for specific formats and yes, we have to change a little bit in our routes. We have to add that dot column format thing in our path because we can do funny thing with the, dot for with the format. We don't have to create any code. That's the nice thing because this plugin will just see at the end you're falling through at the end of your subroutine. It has a data structure. At the top you said this thing here with dot format and the whole plugin will say, oh yes, you wanted XML, I'll render XML. You want JSON, here's your JSON format. You want data dumper, there's your data dumper. Good, so we try, there we go. Go to this specific URL and of course, why does it give you a 404? Because you didn't tell it that you wanted a specific .json. We didn't tell you, uh, the server, that you wanted YAML. We said it's client-driven content negotiation. You need to specify it in the URL. You get a complete new resource on the internet. It's a complete path of the URI. It's not the same user anymore. It's a different thing. The .yaml and the .json are two different resources in your API now. If you don't specify it, it's not there. 404, fine. Back to last year, language. Ah, I love languages. So, the answer to a plugin multi-lang. Probably not the most suitable thing to create for APIs, but what it does, and it's very common on the internet for web pages, is that you have your host name, then slash, and then two letters for a language, and then the rest of the path comes there. Oh, you wrote left and right, it's for, never mind. Um, so you get your host name, two letters for the language, and the rest of your URL. Oh, that's fine for different languages. It works for German, it works for English, Dutch. But again, every language becomes now a specific resource in your REST API. 
not the most elegant way. Now, here's a tiny example. I skipped the user for a while because I don't have multilingual users, but I do have a uh, translation table, just a silly example. So this hash translations has uh, four uh, keywords, morning, afternoon, evening, night, so you can do a greeting, say, I want a greeting for the afternoon, and the English version it will, hmm? Boah. Okay, then there's a typo again. <laughs> Make notes, send patches. Ah, good. Um, so, if you want a specific translation for the greetings in your nice um, web application where you're building on the front end, now you can just say, I want the German version of evening, and it will say, Guten Abend. Right. Now, we need to build a little bit further because this is only the definition of my translation tables. So let's look at what's happening in Dancer itself. We get his uh, translations um, just as a root of your, um, your API. We have translations and we can specify it actually in the format because I still have that plugin uh, rest there. I can still do that. Woo. Means I can have XML versions of it. I don't know why, but I can have. And what is it doing? Um, it returns that hash, and in the middle there is a tiny little thing. It will give you also the specified language, which is nice, so we can look up in our translations table uh, which hash ref we are passing back. And yes, good. Now there's one thing, I'm not sure, actually you didn't test it because <coughs> translate, uh, my presentation was gone since Sunday, I hadn't time to test it. I don't know what happened if I go to this URL without the language in it. It might break. What, I, what will happen if I do a language that doesn't exist in my table? I have no idea. But this will work. If you do um, get localhost DE for German and then all the translation dot JSON, don't forget it, dot JSON here, you will get this nice table here. And yes, it's still the same. Good. Guten Abend. Noch immer. All right. Well, then this slide here. Mr. Edison was right, because what I just showed you, I think is not a nice way to build your REST APIs. It's confusing, it's horrible, bad design, bugs in it, <coughs> and it's skipping a lot of REST API design. Okay, I've written a plugin called HTTP Content Negotiation, and what it will do is what the specs have written down ages ago, I mean ages ago. I'm talking about internet prehistory, like uh, the beginning of the internet. Go back to our translations again. This was it. We're going to change it a little bit. Have a different plugin. Wow, that's a big change. Woo. And then, watch out. This is going to be a very big change. Watch and see. So we have our route translation still, and then we get some funny keyword called HTTP choose language, which takes a list of available languages and subroutine pairs. And in this case, we already have a list of available languages, and we have one specific subroutine. I could do it for German, one specific one. I could do a to JSON for German. I could say if you have English, for some reason, give me a subroutine that will do it to XML. I can do weird things with it. I can say, um, if this, if you would have here a uh, Romanian, then I can have a subroutine. I said, sorry, I don't understand Romanian. I can do anything there. Um, and it also has a HTTP chosen language, which makes it easy to get the right language you have chosen in your API. And if you don't specify one, Ah, we have defaults, good. I love defaults, especially when you can specify them. Good. This is what you will get back. I didn't specify any language. So you don't get back the German one, you will get back the English one. However, if I do this in my request, I say accept language and then some funny string there, a language um, range, which says English, by the way, mm, 
not so really fond of English, I give it a 0 0.8 value. Otherwise, give me Dutch or German in equal priority with a priority of 1.0, which is the highest you can have. But since we didn't have any Dutch, you will get the German version back. That's fine. This works. Good. Happy with it. Anybody can read this? Good. This one. Let's change this uh, user thing now back again. We had this thing with the users. We have been playing that for a while. Go back from <laughs> translations to users. Let's change this one. So we have here a little bit different version. I'm not talking about languages anymore. I'm here going to generate different versions of our users. And I've tweaked a little bit. Um, but again, you can see here, you HTTP choose media type. And um, yeah, then there's uh, something funny happening with the user serialized fields. I didn't want to have all that <coughs> stuff there. So I tweaked a little bit around in my DBX class thing here. I made a small method serialized fields, which will return you a Perl structure with names, nicknames, and email. And since we um, have these serializers, these serializers take a data structure, and depending on which one you have chosen, the application JSON will return it into JSON. Those calls there, two JSON, two YAML, two Dumper, these are already there by Dancer 2. Don't have to worry about it. Works out of the box. Now, let's go to this uh, URL again. Oh. And why is it returning this huge error on the back of my, ha back of my shirt? It says not acceptable. Why? Because we specified here that the default is undef. It means that don't come back with any answers if you didn't specify something that I can understand. If I can't do your request, if it would say, um, give me an accept of uh, application JSON, this will be fine. Would I have said, and give me an image slash JPEG, it will say, what? No, can't do that, it will say 406, not acceptable. You have to specify it. And for languages, it's actually uh, suggested that you always return a language because at least most people can read something of it. People are not so, so picky about languages. However, computers are very picky. If you say, I want application JSON, and you come back with XML, guess what? No, your, no, won't work. Good, one of the other plugins I wrote, very important for REST APIs, is this one, HTTP caching. And why is it so important? Well, the whole design of REST APIs, the whole design of REST, the whole design of HTTP, is that you have a layered system, which means you have your uh, server, you have your client, but your client doesn't know what it's talking about, to whom, and it can just talk to whatever. It doesn't know if there is a caching system in between or not. But if there is a cache in between, yes, you can have those speed advantages, but you need to tell it with these keywords I've written in my route here, that you want to have it a maximum lifetime of an hour or when it needs to get away. That's um, the end of this uh, Sunday. It wouldn't exist for the end, end of Saturday, of course. The end of Saturday, Saturday night, it will just not be there anymore, yeah? And this is what will happen if you do the request. It will ha nicely have these two uh, response headers. And now your caching mechanisms do know what to do with it, when to invalidate it, when to get rid of it, or even better, your application knows what to do with it. Because why would your application go all the way to the internet? If you have mobile devices, please build into your mobile device your caching mechanism. If you have normal internet, fine. Um, you can go to uh, whatever uh, proxy server and ask the cache, give me something back. Now, still talking about caching mechanisms, a different thing on it. These are the HTTP conditional requests. My previous one is not doing any caching. It's only directing caching servers in the middle what to do with it. But once in a while, these caching servers think, that's quite old. It just told me that it can only be valid for an hour. 
let's talk to the server again, the origin server. And then the origin server will say something very funny. It will say, yes, I still can, you, you can still use it or you cannot use it. It is a new one. You have to do that once in a while. So what do we do here? Let's insert something conditional here. Yes, there it is. HTTP conditional. It will give you a last modified. You probably get it from the user somewhere. Um, and it has the last updated field somewhere in that user. And then guess what? If you now make the request with the if modified since Friday, the 1st of January, it will say, nah, it's not updated. You get a three or four back, it's not modified. You find cache, go on. If your client asks to deliver this piece of data, you have it in your caching memory, serve it right away. Me as a server is not being bothered anymore. Good. The other thing conditional requests is about, very important, because REST APIs are stateless. That's what REST means. Resources, uh, blah, blah, blah. Stateless. Oh, forget about it. Bad memories. Good. One thing you will have to be very careful about is that uh, once in a while, because you're in a multi-user environment, one user is going to change some resources on the internet. You just change the name of the user. And then you want to update it as well, or you want to delete it, or whatever you want to do with it. You cannot lock your database tables. Stateless design. So we need to work around it. So this is a way where we say, I want to update it with put. And you can forget the other code. You first try to find it. And then here we can see conditional. And I tell you, it's required because these unsaved methods I put and delete, you really should make sure that you don't do something silly, overwrite on somebody else's changes. Um, and of course, there's the same thing, last modified day there. And guess what? This is what we're going to do. We're going to put this local host user with a nice funny ID. And we put some uh, JSON structure there with new name and the complete thing. And it says 428, precondition required. It's not the most famous error condition, but it's there. We just told you it's required. You have to supply this thing here. You need to supply the if modified. So if this resource was recently updated, so let's say um, after uh, the 1st of January, yeah, probably I did because I was just playing with my stuff uh, the other day, two weeks ago. So it has been updated since the 1st of January. And now it says precondition failed, which tells your client, like, <coughs> don't do this. You're not talking about the same resources anymore. They have been changed. All right, what about this? Try to update this whole resource again, but with another date modified. Uh, if it's modified at Friday, uh, 4th of March, yes, then it's okay. Now it can do it. You already see there's a lot of stuff going on in all these requests in building a REST API. It's getting more complicated. I have a thing that's called HTTP auth extensible. We want to authorize people, especially with updating stuff, getting stuff from the database, usually be fine. It's a public API usually, and say, yeah, you can get a list of talks. You can get a list of uh, whatever. Some things you won't. So this thing here, this was our um, update version from three slides ago. Now make sure that uh, we have a uh, authorization in between. Ah, yes, making life hard. HTTP require role admin. If you're not an admin, you can't do this. If you are an admin, it will be fine. Um, it will give you the 403, 401 errors if you are not uh, an admin. And the whole way you set up is again in those nice config files. Now, I mentioned a lot of stuff. And yes, I'd like to have an easy life. More easy already than it already is. HTTP bundle. Why? Because this is horrible. This is what I like. And this is what you get. You get your caching stuff with a bunch of HTTP keywords. There's a whole lot of caching uh, directives you can have there. It will 
set the expire date and the cache control in your response. It will give you a three or four if it's not modified for the safe methods like get, nice for your caching mechanisms. It will give you the precondition required or failed if you want to update them or delete them for unsafe methods. It's all built in. Otherwise it will do the okay. It will give you content negotiation with these uh, chose language and chose media types where you can have defaults or even no defaults. It will do the 406 not acceptable. It will also, very important for caching mechanisms, give you a return in your response header very because all of a sudden, if you have different media types, your cache needs to know which media type it has actually in its cache. So there are different versions of it. For languages, the same thing. It needs to know if that you have different languages used to require the same resource. You also get auth extensible with 401 um, if it's not authenticated. Be very careful with it. Unauthorized is a stupid word. Should be not authenticated. A simple require login. You get it. You can have one role, any roles, a whole list of roles. All roles need to apply. You need to be an admin and you need to be uh, a female user, whatever. You can be uh, anything there. So that's just doing fine. Four, three, forbidden. Actually, if you are authenticated, but you do not have the re uh, uh, access rights to do this thing. You're not always an admin, you might, might be just a normal user. So, rest assured, I'm done. I would say, keep calm, <laughs> rest API on. Done it, good. Any questions? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, there's a microphone here. Whoa. You have to list, oh no, that's good. If it's getting too long, then I will just have to discuss, Hello? discuss it later on. Okay, so first one, you had those um, HTTP choose media type and choose language. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and you put that in the route handler. Can yep. you also do that like as a general thing that you do it once and then it does it for all the routes? Because I mean, if you have a REST API, then you don't have one route, you have like a bunch of resources. And it's, it seems like it's like a shitload of code. You're making a good point there. Um, at this stage, it's there uh, that you will still have to specify them. It will move on to the next stage, and I d discussed it with Dave Cross as well, and said it's too much coding still. Can you move a lot of stuff into um, uh, the config file? And then it will just do it for all the resources there. It will do a um, hook after and render it and check if your objects where you cost done your returning object, not any long data structures. Uh, it will check if your objects do these specific uh, methods. Can it render into JSON? Can it render into an application PDF? Can it render into JPEG? If so, then it will use those methods um, in your accept media type. Mm -hmm. so and yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and you were showing that it does a lot of the um, of the status codes automatically. I think there's this like huge discussion in the REST community um, where people are like discussing what um, status what status codes for what and which verbs for what. And I mean, all of those caching ones you showed are pretty good. But um, I mean, if I create something with post or maybe with put, depends on who I am. Yep. Some people like put more. Um, so if I have a post, um, like a post route, for example, mm -hmm. um, then obviously that creates something. Will it do a 201 created OK automatically instead of 200 OK if I don't specify no, it? No, I haven't speci specifically not mentioned those there. It's still up to you at the end of the route when you have a uh, put or a post that you will have to say it's either 200, 201, or 202. Even if you have, for example, a delete, it can just tell you accept it and then go off to a different uh, remote service, do the whole trick, but at least you have your response back. I left them out specifically. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Anyways, I love your feedback because uh, it needs to improve. And once I got it on the internet uh, in December, I already got the first request like, oh, can you change this, can you change that? So yes, moving on, good. Thank you for your, time, attention, 
Love to be here in Germany. See you next time. Oh, by the way, don't forget, Jim, the Dutch Pearl works on the 1st of April. <laughs>